If you ever face a situation of alienation, of discord, of conflict, an urgent priority is to figure out what it will take to make things right. In the great alienation of humanity from God, what was it going to take for the door to be open, for the relationship to be restored? What was it going to take? Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller, and Jonathan, we can't let a question like that just hang out there unanswered. What does it take for us to be made right with God? That's the key question, isn't it? And it is what we're going to be thinking about in our passage today. Paul has an answer for us. He tells us that Jesus has reconciled us to God in his body of flesh by his death. It took the coming of Jesus to earth as a human being, and it took his death on the cross to pay the price of our sin and to achieve reconciliation for all who would believe. And that's what we're going to be thinking about together today. Well, if you can, I do hope you'll grab your Bible and meet us in the book of Colossians, because this is such an important truth for us to understand. So we're going to be in chapter 1, really focusing for the most part on verses 21 to 23 today as we continue our message reconciled through Jesus. Here is Jonathan. God was holy and righteous in all his interactions with us, and he still is, in all his judgments toward us. But although we were in the wrong, we were also at the same time entirely powerless to make things right, to do anything about the crisis of relationship. God is high above us. He dwells in unapproachable lights, in the light of his holiness in his heavenly home. We had no access to him. There was no way of us getting up there. We couldn't reach him. But the wonder of his grace and the heart of the gospel is this, he came down to us. He came to meet us in our crisis and he came to meet us in our need. It's not that he simply traveled to this world, that he made a fleeting visit to the disaster zone for a quick photo op. He didn't just come to our locality, visit our community, stay a while in our vicinity. No, he did something profoundly more wonderful. In Christ, he became one of us. That's the truth wrapped up in that phrase that Paul uses, his body of flesh. The Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, took on flesh, became human. And this step the incarnation of Christ as we speak of it. This step was necessary. This step was vital. This step was essential if reconciliation was to be achieved. You see, the cost of our sin is nothing less than death itself. The Bible makes it so clear that for the problem of sin to be dealt with, there needs to be a death to pay the price. There needs, in fact, to be a human death to pay for human sin. And God in his divinity, well, God cannot die. The eternal God, he is not subject to death, but death would be needed for this reconciliation. That was the basic precondition. If things were going to be made right between us and God, death was going to be essential. The price of sin is always death. Adam and Eve learned that in the garden. They were warned that if they disobeyed God, they would surely die and and die they did. Paul writes elsewhere that the wages of sin is death. It's the price set by God himself. It is the price his justice demands. For us to be forgiven, for our debt to be cleared, for the justice of God to be satisfied, for the relational barrier to be removed, there needed to be a death, a human death, to pay for human sin. And Jesus gave his body, the body of his flesh, to pay the price, to suffer and to die in our place. His body, his flesh, became the place and the means of reconciliation. He came to us in humanity. He came to us in flesh, and he gave himself to die. It's an extraordinary thing, isn't it? When people enter into situations of danger for the good, for the salvation of other people, when people willingly do that in order to save others, firefighters do that all the time. That's why they're such natural and rightful heroes within our community. That's why we're so very thankful for them. On a few occasions in history, there have been instances where a nuclear reactor has malfunctioned and crews, you know, have got to go in and deal with the situation, seek to make adjustments and repairs to avoid a full meltdown. You may know that one such occasion, the first one actually, took place not far from here in Ottawa at Chalk River in 1952. You may know the story. Future American President Jimmy Carter was uh, posted with the Marines at Schenectady in New York State. 
and they were sent up, he and a number of, of, of others were sent up to assist. And Jimmy Carter actually took turns being lowered into the reactor to conduct repairs. The case was similar to what happened at the nuclear power station at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania in 1979, where folk had to go in, crews had to go in and absorb high levels of radiation, face huge risk in order to save countless lives. It's a remarkable thing to do, isn't it? A noble thing to sacrifice personal safety for the good of others. But Jesus, he not only embraced risk, not only faced torture and shame, agony and loss, he entered willingly into death itself. Now, friends, this is the fundamental basis of everything in the Christian life. This is the bedrock of the Christian faith. And we just need to remember it. The reason we are gathered here today, the reason we love the Lord Jesus Christ, the reason we, we, we want to know him, the reason we want to serve him, it is because he came to us in the flesh. He became one of us. He did so in order that he could die in our place he, he did so in order that he might face that which you and I would do anything to avoid. And until that simple but profound truth sinks deep down into our heart, each one of us, Jesus and his gospel will mean very, very little to us. We won't understand it, and we won't appreciate him. The Christian message will be empty, and the Christian message will be strange. And so let me ask you at this point, have you reckoned with the fact that God the Son became a human being, took on flesh, and died the death that you deserve, that you might be reconciled to the God who made you? That's what he's done for us. And it's breathtaking and beautiful, and it's humbling, and it's life-giving. But now we ask the obvious question, why? Why has he done this? And that's our next area of focus. Why has he done this? Or more precisely, what was his purpose and what was his aim? Of course, any great and costly project must have a purpose. It, it must have an aim. You don't undertake cost and suffering and inconvenience and loss for no reason. And the all-wise, all-knowing God certainly would not do that without purpose. What was he seeking to achieve in coming to us in the flesh, in the person of his son, to suffer and to die? What was his purpose? What was he doing? Well, it's right there in the middle of verse 22. In order to, in order to, that's a purpose, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. That's why he came. That was his purpose. That's why he took on flesh. That's why he suffered. That's why he died. Now, we all know what it is to prepare a great project for a final presentation. In recent days in our home, two of our children have been working on separate projects that were to be presented publicly after a long period of preparation, one a performance, one a speech. Hours went into these. In one case, uh, the best part of a year was invested. And in a situation like that, you always have in view, don't you, the final presentation. Perhaps there will be an audience. Uh, perhaps there will be judges. And everything focuses, doesn't it, on that grade and that final day. You've got it constantly in view, and rightly so. The work of reconciliation, the work of saving sinners through his blood, the saving acts of Jesus, the saving act of Jesus at the cross, it is done with a singular day in view and a singular presentation in mind. In shedding his blood for us at the cross, the Lord Jesus first and foremost, above all things, was preparing us for the judgment that is to come. The Bible tells us that there is a great day toward which all of human history is heading unstoppably. You may not be clear about that fact. That may not be unfamiliar to you, but it's important that you become familiar with it. You see, the God who created this world will one day call this world to a final accounting. The God of creation, the Bible tells us, is also the God of judgment. And that makes sense, by the way. The two actually go together naturally. If God made this world, then this world is accountable to him. It is his. And as his creatures, we must answer to him. In the judgment to come, the Bible tells us none of us could stand on our own merits. None of us could come through that experience unscathed. None of us could hope for an acquittal. But the work of Jesus at Calvary was calculated to achieve salvation for sinners at the judgment. It was designed and planned to achieve for you and for me a not guilty verdict that we could otherwise never hope, never expect 
to hear. Jesus shed his blood for us in order to prepare us for that great and that coming day. He shed his blood for us that he might be able, more specifically, to make a joyful and powerful presentation of us at the judgment. He shed his blood that he might, on a day yet to come, have the joy of presenting us the prizes for which he died, that he might present you the prize for whom he died, holy and blameless and above reproach. Holy, that is, set apart from all that is evil, set apart for God's own use, made clean, blameless, not subject to any accusation that anyone could bring. No blame, nothing would stick because there's no guilt remaining. Above reproach, no one could bring charges against you. No one could undermine your standing before God. And we look at those words, those wonderful words, and they are wonderful, aren't they? We look at those words and we think of that day and our first thought might be this, you know, it's hopeless. It's a wonderful thought, but it's hopeless. My life isn't holy enough. I know there's blame. Even if other people weren't concerned to blame me, there is so much I personally regret, so much for which I blame myself, and I know I could face reproach, if not from others, from myself I face it. I don't stand a chance. That's the first thought. But then we remember the first half of verse 22. Jesus brought about reconciliation in his body of flesh by his death. Jesus, the truly holy, the blameless and above reproach one, stood in my place and died my death that his standing might be given to me in a great exchange and my guilt might be taken away. Now that was his great purpose. And the great outworking of this, the great victory of this, will be seen in that coming day on presentation day at the judgment where people belonging to Jesus by faith will be presented with joy before the Lord. The verdict will be given, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. What we were, what he has done for us, why he has done it, and finally as we finish, what we must do. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths, and we're going to continue to take a look at what the reconciling work of Jesus at the cross means for each and every one of us. So I hope you'll stay with us. We'll get back to that in just one moment. Hey, I want to let you know that if you ever miss a broadcast of Encounter the Truth, you can always come and listen online. Our website is EncounterTheTruth.org, and you can stream the program or download an MP3 for free. Again, that's at EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, if you happen to join us a little bit late, we're in the book of Colossians. We're in chapter 1, looking at verses 21 to 23 today. So grab a Bible and join us there as we get back to our message, looking at the reconciling work of Jesus. Here is Jonathan. What we were, what he has done for us, why he has done it, and finally as we finish, what we must do. That's our final focus, what we must do. Where does this all leave us and what must we do? Verse 23, notice it with me. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Now here at this point in this verse, we encounter a dynamic that we encounter a number of times throughout the New Testament, a a dynamic we can often find a little baffling, a little bit challenging. Paul has been speaking about the past reality of what Jesus has already done for sinners. Paul told us in verse 22 that Jesus has now reconciled us to God through his death on the cross. That's true of all believers. He then speaks of the future and and the outworking of this, that Jesus' aim is to present us holy and blameless and above reproach before the Father at the final day. But now here is a kind of condition that almost seems to come in. He intends to present us that way if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast. Well, how does that all add up? (laughs) How do we make sense of that? Surely if we have been reconciled already, then, you know, we're all set. Our future is secure. And that is indeed true, by the way. Our salvation is not something that comes and goes, as some would teach. It's not something we can lose. No. This is the same Paul who wrote to the Philippians that he is confident. You may remember this, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It's the same Paul. So what's he saying here? 
Well, he is pointing us to the fact, and this is really important, he's pointing us to the fact that one of the marks of true conversion to Christ, one of the key marks of saving faith, of gospel belief, one of the key marks is this, it is endurance. Endurance. You see, there are plenty of folk who make some kind of a nod of a profession of faith in Christ, plenty of people who make noises about that, but have not actually received the gospel, have not actually turned from sin, not actually understood who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for them. And those people, they, they don't endure. They make an initial noise, but they don't keep going. It, it's the same dynamic you may remember that Jesus spoke about in the parable of the, the sower and the soils. You remember how the farmer scatters the seed and much of it doesn't come to take root and to grow and bear fruit. So much of it is actually lost, even if there's a little bit of life at the beginning. Not everyone who hears the gospel and makes noises of response is actually converted to Christ. Not everyone who hears and indicates belief has actually been reconciled to God. So Paul, he's very careful. He doesn't want to give false assurance to people who aren't saved. When he looks forward to that final judgment day, he doesn't want to promise people that all will be okay if they're not actually believers. And so here he sets out a mark of true belief, of, of living faith, of, of gospel trust, and it's this, it is endurance. True believers keep going to the end. Those whom God has reconciled by faith in Jesus, those same people he will keep until the very end. And while all this rests upon the grace of God, you and I, we wouldn't endure if it came down to us to endure. We're not passive in this at the same time. No, there's something for us to do. We are called to be active in our faith. God expects us to invest ourselves in our spiritual endurance. And notice what he wants us to do, verse 23. Continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel you heard. You know, the life of faith can be a pretty long journey, go on for quite a long time. Many of us will follow Jesus for years and for decades. Many among us have been following Jesus 20 years, 30 years, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years. There are those among us in the church family, those who will be listening, who have been following Jesus for the best part of a century, I guess. You know, sometimes it feels like making it to the end of a really rough day or a rough week is just about all we can do. We all know that feeling. But we do need to think of the long term. We need to think about what it looks like and what it means to go the distance. I was hearing the other day that some friends had chosen to travel to Europe the old-fashioned way rather than flying. They had booked to go this time on an ocean liner to travel by sea and, and a long voyage on a great ship presuming it's a safe voyage, as it usually is these days, the picture of that ship sort of plying the waves is a wonderful picture, isn't it, of steady progress and stability. Whatever fierce storms it may encounter in the North Atlantic, whatever winds and waves, the great liner, it just plows on steadily unmoved. And, and even in the midst of the storm, the passengers, they, they, they dine comfortably and sleep peacefully. Or you think of a, a train, a great train, traveling from one side of Canada to the other. We sometimes see them driving along the St. Lawrence River on the north side of Lake Ontario, these great freight trains, 40 cars, 50 cars, 60 cars, steadily making their way along the great distance. You and I, we need to be those who steadily continue unmoved day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, decade by decade. Now that's the picture. That's the call. That's the need. And here's how it happens. We are to be not shifting from the hope of the gospel, the gospel that we heard, the apostolic gospel, the one that has been proclaimed throughout the whole world, end of verse 23, the one that Paul proclaimed. We are to be unmovably and unshakably grounded in the apostolic biblical gospel and the hope it proclaims. And friends, that's precisely why Paul has been at pains in this passage and why we've taken the, the time to listen to it. It's why he's taken the trouble to remind us of the core of the gospel. That's what this passage is about. That's what he's been up to. He's told us the truth again. He's taken us once more to Calvary that we might stay there and actually never depart. Now, if you know this gospel, if it is precious to you, I hope that it moves you to hear it again. 
I find that the true people of God love to hear again and again what Jesus has done for them, what he's done for you, what he's done for me. We need to hear it often. We need to hear it week by week, don't we? That's why we've taken the trouble to be here. We need to hear it. We need to be reminded. It's as the hymn writer put it rather nicely. Tell me the old, old story. Remember that one? Of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. Tell me the story simply as to a little child. For I am weak and weary and helpless and defiled. Tell me the story slowly that I may take it in, that wonderful redemption, God's remedy for sin. Tell me the story often, for I forget so soon the early dew of morning has passed away at noon. We need to hear the old, old story, do we not? We need to be reminded of the hope of the gospel so that we might never shift from it, might never be moved from it. And I, I close just by saying this. If this old, old story, the story of Jesus and his glory, the story of Jesus and his love, if this is actually new to you, as it may be for some, don't rest until you find out more. Don't let this drop. Don't rest until you get the story clear, until you're ready to make your own personal response to Jesus Christ, a response of repentance, a response of faith, which will allow you to take hold of all that Jesus has done for you and which will allow you to share in the hope of which we've been speaking. We, we would love to share more of that with you. We would love to talk it through. We would love to pray it through. But don't rest until you have it clear. Don't rest until you know for sure don't rest until you have made your own response to Jesus and his love. Let's pray together as we finish. Our Father, we thank you for the old, old story. We thank you for Jesus and his glory. We thank you that in love he took on flesh and died in our place that we might be reconciled to you and that in days of chaos, we might have hope. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth and a message called Reconciled Through Jesus. Such an important thing for us to understand. Maybe you want to go back and listen to this broadcast again or any previous broadcast in the series. You can do that at our website, EncounterTheTruth.org. Or you can listen through the Encounter the Truth app, which is free. You'll find it at your favorite app store. Well, the podcast, the radio program, all that we do here in Encounter the Truth is supported by your generosity. So thank you for giving to this ministry. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to send you a book called Can We Trust the Gospels? And Jonathan, why did you pick this book? Well, I think it's so important for us who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to know that our access to the truth of who he is and what he said is reliable. We look to the Gospels to give us the word of Jesus and to show us the person of Jesus. But we've got to ask the question, are, are, are these documents reliable? And Peter Williams has done us such a great service in this book because he's, he's not only answered the question in the affirmative and said yes, he's given us arguments to bolster that case. And I believe we need to engage with those arguments carefully. I, I believe we need to think these things through. I believe we shouldn't be scared of examining evidence. And Williams has laid out the evidence very clearly in a very accessible way and in a very helpful way. And I just feel so strongly that our, our listeners need to have access to these arguments, access to this evidence. And I, I think that engaging with it, reading it, is going to be a tremendous encouragement. I, I also want to say, if you're someone who's exploring the faith, you'll want to think these things through. You know, is the Bible reliable? Are the Gospels a true record? I'd encourage you to think that through, and I'd love to get this book into your hands to help you think it through carefully and clearly. Again, the name of the book is called Can We Trust the Gospels? And it's our thank you gift to you for financially supporting Encounter the Truth this month. You can find out more or give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 1-833-998-7884. That's 1-833-99-TRUTH or EncounterTheTruth.org. 
For Jonathan Griffiths, I'm Steve Hiller. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time.